everybody. Welcome back to the Compass Church and our new series called Angels, Real or Imagined. We are in week two of this series and I'm already having so much fun learning about this largely unknown part of reality and God's creation. Want to jump back into Angels with everybody at our Bolingbrook campus, thinking of you. Those of you at Three Rivers, welcome. South Naperville, Naperville, Wheaton, and online friends. Particularly, everybody who's checking us out for the first time. Maybe you're a visitor. You are welcome, and we are so glad you've chosen to join us. As we dive back into our study called Angels, I need to tell you that a few months ago, I received a package in the mail. That's always exciting, isn't it? But as I checked it out, I'm like, wait a minute, I don't know that sender. And sometimes when I don't know the sender, I get a little nervous. I'm like, wait a minute, what is this? And even opening up the package can be a little, you know, some apprehension. Well, nothing to be worried about. It was my snow globe. Do you remember the snow globe from my Christmas Eve service? How much fun. Well, snow globe, I can feel good about that. But why is it that I get nervous about packages? Well, that anxiety is because I grew up in a time where age 10, 1978 through when I was, oh, in my 20s, it was 1995. Those were the years of the Unabomber. Do you recall? The Unabomber was this scary individual by the name of Ted Kaczynski. He lived in Montana in the woods. He was a recluse in a tiny, tiny little shed. No kidding. His house was like one room, eight by eight. And Ted Kaczynski, over those 17 years, he mailed 16 bombs. So sad. He would package these bombs and put nails in them, and as folks unwrapped them, they would explode. And he randomly killed three people, seriously injured 23. It was a strange time when the FBI were doing all they could to find this guy. But they just couldn't until finally, in 95, he was captured and he remains in prison to this day. Ted Kaczynski, a guy living in a shed, killing people randomly. I mean, that's just evil at its highest level. How does a guy get like that? Well, as it turns out, friends, I am at the home of Ted Kaczynski. Welcome to Evergreen Park. Illinois. It's a little suburb of Chicago on the southwest side. And we're at a park right now that's across the street from Ted's house. Friends, this is the park where little Ted grew up. And what's so odd is as reporters have talked to the folks here in Evergreen Park, they will tell you again and again that little Ted seemed as normal as they get. He was a cute little guy who was According to neighbors, kind, nice, polite. Uh, Ted played trombone in the marching band and he was part of the math club at school. He just seemed like an ordinary kid with loving parents who were devoted to his well-being. Ted was exceptionally smart. In fact, he had an IQ of 167. That puts him at the genius level. He skipped two grades and actually was accepted to Harvard University at the age of 15. Can you imagine that? When you hear about a kid who's just so, got a lot going for him and seems, you know, poised for a healthy, well-adjusted life, how can he turn into such a evil serial killer? It's a good question. Folks have come to Evergreen Park here in search of answers to that dynamic. Friends, it's that type of dynamic that we're studying today. As you will recall, we're looking at these beings called angels who in so many ways are like us. You know, God made them with intelligence and free will and creative passions. And as we look at their history, there's one angel in particular that leaves us baffled. 
His name was Lucifer. And you know him by the name Satan or the devil. And he is evil personified. He is a killer, a destroyer. And like Ted Kaczynski, we wonder, how did he become that way? Especially when we turn to the Bible and read about him. For example, in Ezekiel 28, verse 12 says this. This is God speaking of Lucifer. You were the perfection of wisdom and beauty. You were given clothing adorned with every precious jewel in settings of the finest gold. I appointed you to be the anointed guardian angel. You had access to the holy mountain. You were perfect in all you did from the day you were created until the day evil was found in you. Your great wealth filled you with turmoil and you sinned. Therefore, I cast you out of the mountain of God. You you realize that this Lucifer, he was beautiful. He was brilliant. He was beloved of God and entrusted with high position and authority. How did it go so wrong? Friends, just as people have sought to understand how Ted Kaczynski uh, changed into this evil monster, so we long to understand how Lucifer became Satan. And that's exactly what we're going to study in week two of Angels. You know, last week, our message was entitled Guardian Angels. And this week, it's entitled Fallen Angels, looking at this epic event in the angelic history where Lucifer rebelled and with him, other angels as well. Friends, I just want to give you a heads up. Like last week, I am diving into a bunch of different scriptures It's the nature of the study of angels that requires we use more scripture than I typically do. I normally like to focus in on one passage. Well, uh, not not this week. I'm going to start in Revelation 12, verse 7. It simply says, there was a war in heaven. Friends, this is a reference to this angelic fight this battle between God's kingdom and the kingdom of Satan, the kingdom of darkness. And the question could be like, when did this war happen? When did all this tension begin? Well, it was probably a long, long time ago. It turns out that scripture indicates the angelic realm, the angels, were created long before the earth. In fact, it says in Job chapter 38, verse 7, that the angels rejoiced when they saw God make the foundations of the earth. And so angels have been around a long, long time, and it's possible, probable, that this conflict was a long, long time ago. Um, this is an important point. Uh, some, some of you have come up to me and said, so you're telling me, Jeff, that people don't become angels when they die? <laughs> no, friends. It's one of the crazy folklore beliefs, somehow that people, when they die, become angels. That's just uh, created by history and humanity. The biblical truth is that angels were created long ago before human beings were made and humans don't become angels, two different uh, creations of God. All right, this war. Well, the verse goes on to explain about the war. It says, Michael and his angels fought against the dragon and his angels. Isn't that interesting? We have a split of the angels here. And just to identify these characters being described, Michael in Jude 1, 9 is called the archangel. And the word arch means chief. And so uh, there is an organization among the angels with ranks. And apparently this guy, this angel named Michael is extremely high ranking. In fact, he's called the archangel, maybe the only one. Uh, Well, it may be that Satan was one too until he fell and lost his position. Some scholars believe that there were two archangels, Michael 
and Lucifer. Lucifer means shining one. Originally, the name was a beautiful name. God said, you are a beautiful shining angel. Lucifer and Michael, potentially the original archangels, but Lucifer fell. He's the dragon. Uh, the dragon is referenced here, and he's got a group of his angels. Michael's got a group of his angels, and they are fighting together. Friends, as it turns out, when Lucifer left the ranks of the loyal, he took with him, Scripture seems to indicate, actually, in this Revelation 12 chapter, that it was a third, a third of the angels sided with Lucifer in his rebellion. Two-thirds remained loyal to God and under the leadership of Michael. And here in this verse, war is ensuing between them. Verse 8, next verse, it says, The dragon, that's Lucifer, lost the battle. This great dragon, the ancient serpent called the devil or Satan, was thrown down to the earth with all of his angels. But when this early battle was uh, won in the case uh, in favor of Michael and the good angels, the, the, the bad angels and Satan, they were thrown to earth. Jesus even says, you know, I was there. I saw when Satan fell like lightning to the earth. And friends, that fall to the earth is God's punishment. God is banishing them from his presence. God is sending them to planet earth. And as a result, they've lost their position. Uh, again, Lucifer is no longer... Uh, the great archangel who was the anointed cherub serving in the presence of God, he's now lost that. And the angels have lost their position, that is, those who have fallen. And even their names change. You know, Lucifer is now called Satan or the devil. And these fallen angels are now called demons. And sure enough, the sides have been established. And when they're thrown to earth, their battle continues. Only now, they're, they're not trying to recruit angels to follow their rebellion so much as humans to follow their rebellion. You remember when they came to earth? Well, one of the things that they've done on earth has been trying to get people to turn from God. Remember, the, it mentions here the ancient serpent. Well, it was the serpent or how Satan appeared in the Garden of Eden as a serpent where he persuaded Eve and then Adam to turn and do the one rule that God had given them when he said, don't eat of the fruit. And so the war continues and the battle for souls wages on. Friends, as, as we look at that little skim of angelic history and this cosmic conflict that, that wages, I find myself going back to that question like with Ted Kaczynski. How did someone who was so good become so evil? How did that fall take place? And that's what I want to look at with you. I want to show you in the scriptures three reasons that I see Lucifer fell and became Satan. Uh, these three reasons are so important for us to study because as you see them, you're going to realize, man, we struggle with the same thing. That decline character-wise, that slide from loyalty to God, it can happen to all of us. So let's learn from the fall of Satan. The first of the causes of his fall was arrogance. We find this in Ezekiel 28. You know, before I read, let me, let me just make a comment. I'm going to read a passage out of Isaiah and out of Ezekiel. And if you look at them in context, you will see that there are evil earthly kings that the prophet is originally describing. I believe that prophecy comes by the Spirit of God moving the heart of the prophet. And I believe that as they were starting off to describe these evil earthly kings, suddenly by the Spirit's leading, maybe even beyond their realization, they started describing the ultimate angelic evil king, Satan himself. They, they end up describing Satan. And it becomes obvious in the context, but I just wanted to acknowledge to you that the passages are applicable to the original earthly evil king as well as to Satan. All right, with that said, 
Ezekiel 28, 17, God says this of Satan. You thought you were so beautiful that it made your heart proud. You thought you were so glorious that it spoiled your wisdom. Those are very helpful verses. You thought you were so beautiful. Well, he was so beautiful. We already read that, that God had made him stunningly attractive. But here's the problem. His thinking regarding his beauty led to pride. Well, what is the, I don't struggle with uh, this as much as some of you, but some of you who are just stunningly good looking, what's the danger? The danger is that we forget this is just a gift of God. If, if you're, you know, unusually attractive, can you boast and say, and look what I accomplished? No, it's just a gift of God. And friends, all of the good things in our lives are just gifts from God. But when we start admiring the good things about us, when we start celebrating the good things about us and find ourselves enamored with our own beauty as opposed to God's beauty, that's when the heart is corrupted and pride falls in. I imagine that Satan originally was all into God, just saying, God, you are the beautiful one. And very little thought about his own beauty. But as time went on, maybe 90% of his thought was, God, you're awesome. 10% was, I'm pretty beautiful myself. And then 80% thought about God and 20% about himself. And that drift continued until he was like, you know what? I'm amazing. And his mind was preoccupied with his own beauty. And he was arrogant, prideful. And friends, this drift can happen in us. The key to humility is not saying I'm ugly or I'm awful or I'm terrible. The key to humility is being primarily enamored with the goodness and beauty of God, which is way beyond our own. And to realize that any goodness and beauty in us is a gift from him. Turn that to praise of God rather than praise of self. Well, in the case of Satan, of Lucifer, this self admiration grew to the point where arrogance and pride filled him. The, the second part of that verse, can I go to it? You thought you were so glorious that it spoiled your wisdom. We had already seen that Lucifer was the wisest angel in all of God's angelic creation. He was brilliant. And that brilliance was all focused on how can I best advance God's cause, bring God glory. But as time waned, uh, he started looking at his own splendor, going, man, I'm, I'm amazing. And it was true. He was impressive. This wisdom could be used in the leading of other angels. And he was an influencer. He could influence other angels. And then, uh, what does that say? Your wisdom was spoiled. That means that what had that, that influencing leadership ability he had that had been used for God started to get spoiled when he used it for self. He said, you know, I can use that same ability I have to influence angels and I can use it to make them enamored with me. And so here this wisdom that God had given that was supposed to be used for God's cause started to get used for selfish gain. And friends, it just that's arrogance, that's self-centeredness that corrupted, spoiled the heart of Lucifer. He became one amazed at his own greatness rather than the greatness of God. So that's arrogance. And the second is another A word, it's ambition. In this case, I'm reading out of Isaiah chapter 14, starting in verse 12. How you have fallen, O Lucifer. You said to yourself, I will ascend to heaven and rule the angels. I will take the highest throne. I will climb to the highest heavens. And I will be like the most high. Ambition. Do you see this Lucifer started to say, listen, I'm, I'm improving my lot. I'm increasing my prominence. 
I'm working to advance my station. And he suddenly is like, I, I want, I'm ambitious. I want to achieve and make my situation better. And he just takes off. Look at all these statements. I will ascend. I will rule. I will take. I will climb. He was, he was upwardly mobile. This is a tough one. Because we uh, Americans, you know, the American dream is all about rags to riches. Uh, ambition is what we're made of. Dream what you can become and go after it. Make it so. And this is making us wonder, is ambition bad? Well, friends, uh, ambition is not bad, but it can be bad. The Bible warns us about selfish ambition. Selfish ambition is when you're, you're dreaming of greatness for you, when it's all about you. Now, there's ambition where people say, I have dreams of what I can do for God or what I can do for others. If, if ambition is not self-engrandizing, it can be a beautiful thing. But when ambition comes, dreams that, first of all, aren't from God, when he aspired to be like God himself, to have the power of God, the worship that God gets. Yeah, this was not a God-given dream. When the, when the dream is not from God and it's all about self, that's selfish ambition, and it will rot your heart out. And so it was with Lucifer. As he saw how his effort could improve his lot, he just started dreaming of ascending and ascending and ascending. We need to be careful of ambition. We need to purify our ambition, saying, Lord, let me not strive after anything that is not your will. You guide me. And may my striving after great things be not my arrogance. You know, this is where arrogance and ambition are combined. May my striving be all about serving you and serving others. May you purify my ambition, Lord. That must be a goal. So ambition can be glorious if God's the one it's all about. Or it can be ugly when we're just into self. Selfish ambition is part of what made Satan fall. So what have we looked at so far? We've got arrogance, one A word, ambition, and then the third is autonomy. <laughs> autonomy is when you're like, listen, my life, I call the shots. One of the things that we see is that these angels were created into a world where God was king. And at first, they loved following God's ways and authority. But part of the angelic rebellion was, you know what? I'm tired of God telling me what to do. I want to do what I want to do. Let me show it to you in the scripture. Here, uh, I'm, I'm deviating a bit from Satan alone, but rather to his angelic friends who turned in the rebellion with him. And, and maybe not even all of the demons, but at least some. It's a curious passage in Genesis 6 that many, maybe you, are unaware of. But I'll read verses 2 and 4. Some of the heavenly beings saw that young women were beautiful. So they took the ones that they liked, the beautiful women. They took them. In those days, there were giants on the earth who were the descendants of the human women and the heavenly beings. These giants were the great heroes of long ago. Is that saying what I think it's saying? Friends, uh, admittedly, this is a debated text, but I, I think it's clear that what it's describing is that angels, fallen angels or demons, could, like good angels, appear as humans. They could materialize into humans. And they saw the beautiful female human beings and decided that they wanted them, that they manifested as male human beings and were so manifest, not only in a physical appearance did they look like humans, but they were functionally like humans, capable of impregnating these women. And sure enough, in uh, the Bible, we see them referred to as the Nephilim, these people who were the offspring of both human and angelic 
parents. And as a result, were even different. They were giant. In fact, if you follow the Nephilim in scripture, a case could be made that Goliath, remember the great enemy of, of King David, that Goliath and his supersized siblings were in fact descendants of these Nephilim. And sure enough, uh, David and his friends ended up killing Goliath and his siblings, his brothers, uh, ending this uh, line of the offspring of angelic rebellion. It's interesting, in Jude 1 and 2 Peter 2, if you study those two sections, I think you'd agree that they're referring back to this angelic perversion and the creation of the Nephilim. Uh, those two passages talk about them not following God's boundaries. You know, God said no to this thing they did, and yet they disregarded God in his ways. Those, ver those verses also talk about God's decision to punish and to imprison those demons who engaged in this sexual perversion. It says in 2 Peter 2.10 about them, it says this, they are those who follow desire and despise authority. That's very helpful, is it not? And don't you feel the same? This, this is their desire for autonomy. They despise God's authority and want to follow their desires. You know, even in sexual sin today, there's so much of that. It's like, hey, I got a desire, I'm going to follow it. Yeah, but God limits sexuality to marriage alone between a man and a woman. And people are like, why would I limit it? I forget your, you and your rules, God. I'll do what I want. Friends, it's been a historic form of rebellion that dates back to the angels themselves who says, yeah, I'm not into following God and his authority and his ways, his rules anymore. I want autonomy. In fact, this, this stuns on me. I used to think, well, why was it that the demons, the fallen angels, why did they find Lucifer more worthy of submission to him than they did to God? Now, there's no way that Lucifer was more wonderful than God. It had nothing to do with wanting to follow Lucifer. They wanted to follow Lucifer's example of rebellion. They didn't want a king anymore. They were the rebels who were refusing to follow the ways of God. They were drawn to autonomy. And friends, that draw is still very prevalent today. So can we talk just as a review? We've got arrogance, we've got ambition, and we've got autonomy, these things that are still very real in us. And the angelic fall serves as a huge warning. It reminds us that we, like the angels, are free will beings, where God has entrusted to us the capacity to make decisions that carry consequence. And like the angels, we can turn away from God and we can slide and we can be corrupted and we can find our lives turning in very scary directions. And so, be warned. You know, I, I, I thought of this when last week I pulled out my little Zuzu bell, remember this? Uh, you, you don't know this, but I had to shine it up. It's a real silver bell and it tarnished. Uh, as it turns out, tarnishing is a corrosion that happens naturally because of the environment. Oxidation, the oxygen in the air causes this metal to uh, corrode. And as a result, when I started, this bell was, it was very dark brown. It looked gross. The tarnishing was severe. And it dawns on me, that can happen to us. Because of the environment, we were born into a corrosive environment. We've got Satan and fallen human beings, because of those who have gone before us, we find ourselves living in a world where the corrosion of character happens naturally. Now, can we blame our environment? No. Again, we are free will beings. We make the choices as influenced by the environment in the direction of corrosion. And so let's be careful. We can start off with a luster. We can have a beauty that is the very nature of God reflected in us. And if we're not careful, just like Lucifer slid until he became the dragon, a monster, it can happen to us. 
Friends, the good news is that not only can, with God's help, we avoid corrosion, we can enjoy sanctification. Uh, the, the Bible talks about the power of God being applied to our lives in a way that restores the luster. You know, polishing is when you rub and you rub and you rub silver until that corrosion, the, the tarnishing, is removed and the original luster returns. And so can we, with God's help, have our eye on our character drift or shift, lean into God, engage in those practices with the church that help us grow closer to him and reflect him more. What's happening to your character? Character changes. It's not stagnant. It will go one way or the other with God's help and with your submission to his kingship. May your life shine with more luster and beauty like Jesus uh, with each passing day. Now, one more thing I need to talk about, and that is in closing, I want to go back to the beginning, a prophecy actually made by God in Genesis 3.15. The, the Satan, uh, the, the serpent, you know, Satan became a serpent, and he was cursed by God with these words. Genesis 3.15 says, one of her, speaking of Eve, one of her descendants will crush your head. <laughs> Love that verse. It's just a reminder of who wins the ultimate war. In the end, the, the, the descendant of Eve, who is Jesus Christ, King of kings and Lord of lords, he will crush Satan. Satan and all of his demons will be thrown into the lake of fire to be removed from us forever. And look, look at this statue. My grandmother, close to her death, passed this on. I grew up as a kid enamored by this little bronze sculpture. And it's of a lion. Jesus is called the great lion of Judah, crushing the head of the serpent. A visual reminder of who wins this great war. Why is that important? Well, it encourages those of us who are on God's side and it reminds those of us who are not, or at least not certain of which side we're on, get on the right side for crying out loud. If you're not on God's side, you're on Satan's side. The Bible says if you're not for me, you're against me. And that's true. And so friends, salvation or getting right with God is the abandonment of the rebellion and the return to the loyal to the king. And I want to close this prayer with a chance for you to get on the right side. Forgiveness through Christ is extended to all. And all you have to do is decide, I'm done rebelling. I want forgiveness, reconciliation, and a new life with God. So if you'd like that, let's pray towards that end now. Lord, we are so immensely grateful for clarity and to realize that we have been born into a war, a war that was waging long before we came around. And God getting on the right side, that's the most important thing of all. And so in this moment, some of us, wherever you may be as you watch this video, you're turning to the King of Kings, to Jesus Christ and saying, forgive me of my sin and accept me back into the ranks of the loyal. I want to be right with my maker both now and after death in heaven. And so I choose to trust Christ today. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.